Hello again, everyone. Uh, I apologize for the delay. I actually read this story once already, but I ran into some technical difficulties um, and then also some, some canine difficulties. My dog lost his mind once uh, while I was reading, um, and it would have involved kind of a lot of editing, which is a, a skill that I want to pick up during this, this time, but um, I'm not there yet, so I would have had to cut, cut together like three different videos. So this is a little bit longer of an entry. Um, it is our second to last story. Just one to go after this one. So this may be a two-parter. Um, I don't think I was able to get it in in 15 minutes, even on the, the three different videos that I needed to capture it the first time. So um, I hope you're digging this. Uh, I'm going to be using this for my sustained uh, reading for 30 minutes from my Google Classroom, which Please go check out uh, that if you're interested in writing about how this situation has impacted you as we move through the days and weeks to come. So this is The Girl's Room by Susan Shrev. The reason I'm in the girl's room with my feet up on the toilet seat so no one can see that I'm in this cubicle with the door locked is because I hate school. I've been here since special reading second period with Miss Burke. That's a long time, and only one girl has come in and peed and washed her hands and left. Already we've had third period and fourth period, and now it's time for lunch. But I won't be having lunch today. I'll probably die of hunger, but I don't mind. It would be worse to be sitting at a long table and opening my lunchbox, which is right now in my locker with a peanut butter sandwich and carrot sticks and a chocolate chip cookie my mother made last night. Miss Burke might be on duty and look around the lunchroom with her pigeon eyes. Has anyone seen Zale Graver? She'd ask. That's my name. There are no other girls in the world called Zale, because my mother made it up. Zale's here, someone would say before I'd have a chance to slip under the table. Zale Graver, come to my classroom immediately, Miss Burke would say. You can't have your lunch or recess or gym until you read chapter one of your chapter book to me without mistakes. That's what I'm afraid she might do, so I'm not going to move from this place in the third cubicle from the door, the only cubicle that has a lock. So you're probably wondering what happened. I can't read. I mean, I can read some things, baby books, and even bigger books with some hard words, and I can sound the words out very slowly. But so far, and I'm in the fourth grade, I've never read a whole book by myself. That's why I'm in Miss Burke's special reading class. I also go to tutoring after school two days a week and in the summers. This morning, I came into school a little late because I skinned my knee running down the front steps of my house, so I had to get a bandage. In my backpack, I had my copy of Peony Bluefish and the Bag Lady, which is my reading book for today. On the cover, there's a picture of this girl my age called Peony Bluefish, which I think is a stupid name for a girl. She's sitting in a rocking chair beside a very old woman who is the Bag Lady. The bag lady is wearing a dress that looks like a blanket, and there's a yellow canary on her head and a great big bag full of junk on her lap, which is why she's called the bag lady. I was supposed to read the first chapter of this book for special reading class, and I didn't have time. My mother said I did have time when I told her this morning I hadn't quite finished my homework. You could have read after dinner when you were watching TV or before you went to sleep, or even after school when you were talking to Esmeralda on the telephone, she said to me. No, I couldn't, I said. My mother's a single mom. That's what she calls herself. My father lives in Daytona Beach with his new children, twin boys I've never met, but I've seen their picture, and they're not too much to look at. Boys get spoiled, my mom says, so a girl has to be able to take care of herself in this world. And that is why I've got to learn to read pronto. Pronto is my mother's favorite word. Now, Zale my mother said just the other night when she climbed into bed next to me to help with my reading. I named you a special name because I knew even when you were a baby you would turn out to be a special girl deserving of such a name. You can't let me down, sweetheart. I don't want to let her down, but I don't want to go to school either because it's too hard and the teachers, especially Miss Caroline Burke the Jerk, don't like me as far as I can tell. School is too hard, I told my mother. She just shook her head with this sorrowful expression on her face and said to me what I had heard from her many times before. Anything worth doing is hard, Zale. Hard until you learn to do it, then it gets easy. I didn't read Peony Bluefish and the Bag Lady because it was too hard. I tried. I really tried. 
I sat down on the couch, and when I came home from school and opened the book and read the beginning of chapter one, Peony Bluefish was an extraordinary girl who lived with her Aunt Potato and Uncle Fargo at the top of a clock tower in Butte, Alabama. I'm sure you know why I couldn't read this book. I didn't even understand the first sentence. I couldn't read the girl's name, or extraordinary, or Potato, or Butte, Alabama, Elmer. Chill. So I put the book back in my book bag, called my friend Esmeralda, which I do every afternoon, and then turned on the TV until my mother got home from work at the supermarket. Every day when I hear her car pull up in front of our little house on Cedar Street, I turn off the TV, take out my books, and pretend I've been working. This morning when I got to school, I was too late for homeroom. I'd missed the role in announcements and the special performance of the four top students in my grade reading their poems in honor of Poetry Month. I wrote a poem for Poetry Month myself, but I wasn't chosen to read it. Starved for Poetry by Zale Graver, fourth grade. Give me a poem with two slices of rye bread. Slap on some ketchup. Make it mayonnaise instead. Cut the sandwich down the middle and pour me some coke. I'll eat the poem line by line, and that's no joke. Even my mother thought I should have gotten an honorable mention, especially since she helped me with the spelling and made up the title. Leela Bundle was just reading her poem to the class when I arrived and the homeroom teacher sent me straight to Miss Burke's special reading, which was in the library. I walked very slowly to the library, stopping to talk to a first grader at the water fountain, waving to Esmeralda, who was in the other homeroom, arriving at special reading four minutes late. I checked the clock. Everyone was sitting around a long table with peony bluefish, etc., open to chapter one. Miss Burke was asking questions about the chapter. Hello, Zale, she said when I sat down and opened my book. Have you read the chapter? Yes, I lied. Then maybe you could describe Peony Bluefish to the class. She's a girl, I said. I was beginning to feel like throwing up. I feel like that a lot in school. Yes, and what else do we know about her? I lowered my head and looked at the first page of chapter one, which is a blur before my eyes. She's friends with the bag lady? Yes, but... We don't know that in the first chapter. The bag lady doesn't come into the book until the second chapter. So, I was stalling for time. Crossing my fingers in the hope that Miss Burke would call on someone else. Tell me about her parents, Zale. I took a guess. A long shot. My mother would call it. They died, I said. I hope you're liking these stories as much as Charlie is liking them. They didn't die, Zale. Miss Burke turned to Lisa, true. Do you know what happened to Peony's parents, Lisa? Her voice was butter. They're on a trip in India and will be gone a long time, which is why Peony is staying with her Aunt Potato, Lisa said. Miss Burke shook her head at me in the way that she has, as if she tries to like me, but I'm a constant disappointment to her. I don't believe you read this book very carefully, Zale. That's not, that's not her voice. I don't believe you've read this book very carefully, Zale, she said, pointing to Betsy Ford, who had her hand in the air. Betsy Ford always raises her hand, shaking it at Miss Burke as if she has emergency information. I used to like her when we were in first grade, but she got smarter, and I must have gotten more stupid. And now whenever I see her, I want to scream. Out, out, damn spot! That's what my mother says when she's in a bad mood instead of saying a swear word. But before Betsy Ford had a chance to say anything, I raised my hand. I have to go to the girls' room, I said. No, Zale, you can wait. Miss Burke replied. I wiggled in my seat, indicating that I actually couldn't wait, but Betsy Ford was talking about India. Now her parents had gone to India on a business trip. That's the sort of thing Betsy will do. She raises her hand to answer a question, and then she changes the subject, and by that time, Miss Burke forgets what the question was. I can't wait, I interrupted. Wow. Let Betsy finish what she is saying. I'm going to have an accident, I said. Miss Burke shot me one of those... You'll do what I say, looks. But already, I had gotten up from my chair and walked across the library, pulled open the heavy doors, and headed down the corridor to the girls' room. The girls' room at City Elementary is like every girls' room in every public school, and only this one is painted turquoise, and it has ten stalls. Ten stalls is a lot of stalls, but City Elementary has to have them because we're the biggest elementary in the city. Two of the doors are off the stalls. One is hanging by the top, and all the locks are broken except the cubicle where I'm hiding. 
but I told you that already. There are six sinks, a long mirror over the sinks, a little shelf under the mirror, and about a hundred paper towels on the floor, even though it's only 11 o'clock in the morning. No one bothers to throw the paper towels in the trash can. So I figure I've been sitting on this toilet seat with my legs up for about an hour and a half. My stomach is growling, and I wish I'd at least slipped the chocolate chip cookies into my pocket. I've read all the graffiti, and there's plenty just in the stall. Most of the time, someone signs her name or draws a picture, and there are a couple of what Miss Burke would call dirty pictures, which I won't describe, but usually the dirty pictures are of boys. There's an excellent picture, and permanent black marker, of a dog with his long ears and a fluffy tail. Boris was here, it says. And there's a big heart for this... A big heart the size of my hand with Mary B. and Tommy C. forever. And someone took the time to write a poem, so she must have been here for as long as a time as I have. Here I am, happy as a clam, sitting on a seat, looking at my feet. I mean, it rhymes, but that's about it for things to read in this cubicle. I've been in trouble at school since first grade when the teachers found out I wasn't learning to read. At first, they were very nice about it. Miss Foster would let me sit on her lap, and she put her finger under the word and helped me sound it out. And Miss Roll, my second grade teacher, helped me with reading during recess and gave me a cookie if I did a good job. Usually it was peanut butter cookie, which is my favorite kind. But that was the end of nice. By the time I was in the third grade, the teachers thought I was doing badly because I didn't try. I worked very hard, I told Miss Burns, who was my third grade teacher. If you worked very hard, we would see some results, Zale she said to me. My, my mother even called Miss Burns on the telephone to say that she worked every night after dinner helping me learn to read, and she knew I was trying. It wasn't exactly true. My mother tried to help. She tried to help me with reading, but it was easy to make her forget why we were sitting on my bed with a book open to chapter one. I start by telling her what had happened that day with Esmeralda and my other good friend, Train. I'd ask which mothers of my friends she'd seen come through the checkout at the supermarket that day. I'd tell her about a fight on the playground, or about some of the older boys smoking behind the shed or trouble in the lunchroom. My mother was easily entertained by conversation, and soon it would be nine o'clock, time for me to turn out my light, and very little work would have been accomplished. By third grade, some of the kids in the class thought I was stupid. You're not stupid, Zale, my mother said. You're smart. You just have trouble reading. No one else has trouble, I said. I bet you're wrong, my mother said. I bet a lot of kids in your class have a problem in reading, or in math, or science, or sports, or singing. It's the way things are. Not at City Elementary, I said. Everyone can read but me, and I'd like to stop going to school. Going to school is the law, my mother said. You have to go to school and learn to read. I'd rather be a waitress or work at a pet store. I'd even rather wash dishes than go to school. You'll learn to read, and then you'll forget that you ever had a problem, my mother said. But so far... She's been wrong. So I'm going to stop right there for part one and um, part two coming up next.